We'll discuss now uh, diagnosing the difference between endodontic and periodontal disease. One of the important things about being able to diagnose between the two and understand the two is that you need to understand endodontic disease. So I'm going to review that real quickly. We look at a normal tooth. Our diagnostic tests are normal. They respond to cold normally, responds to heat normally. It's not really sensitive to percussion. It's not sensitive to palpation. It's a normal tooth. You might also have reversible pulpitis, and reversible pulpitis can come from uh, some recurrent caries, some new caries, uh, a slight amount of caries. The diagnostic features are, yes, it's sensitive to cold, but it goes away immediately. It doesn't really linger at all. And the apex with hypersensitive uh, dentin is normal. So the tissue in the pulp chamber is normal, and the periapical tissue is normal, but caries could be present. Endodontic treatment is not necessary in this case. We then move to irreversible pulpitis. And with irreversible pulpitis, we are making our diagnosis based on the condition of the tissue in the coronal portion of the tooth. The diagnosis is made based on our findings with respect to hot and cold. It could be symptomatic or asymptomatic. The thermal responses are lingering much more than a second or two. It's really lingering. Sometimes you could have throbbing in the tooth when you test with cold or hot. The periapex could be normal, or it could be percussion sensitive. And it's percussion sensitive not because of infection, but because the periapical tissues are affected from the mediators of inflammation. There's no palpation sensitivity on these teeth. You can have a large periodontal ligament space, but in essence, you have vital tissue in the tooth. You may also not have any type of an enlarged periodontal ligament space or an enlargement of the lamina dura. The tissue in the pulp chamber is vital, but it may not be normal. And so that's where, in this case, we have to perform endodontic treatment, and our decision is made on the findings of our pulpal diagnosis. Over time, this tooth can become necrotic, and again, our diagnosis is made on the basis of the tissue that we're finding in the pulp chamber. We know that in this drawing, the way I'm drawing it, is we have necrotic tissue in the coronal portion of the tooth, but we have vital, and in this drawing, normal tissue in the periradicular area of the tooth. So considering this clinical feature, which is not uncommon, uh, the tissue in the canal may be normal, Endodontic treatment is necessary primarily because of the diagnosis we made, coronal chamber of, of the tooth. Well, let's look at uh, where the tissue is becoming inflamed in the periradicular tissues. We have a periapical uh, diagnosis that could still be normal. The apex is normal. You could be percussion sensitive because of the mediators of inflammation. You could have symptomatic apical periodontitis or even possibly asymptomatic. But in this drawing, in this particular case, you can't have a chronic apical periodontitis or an acute alveolar abscess because vital tissue acts as a barrier that was mentioned earlier. It's important to understand this concept. Are there exceptions? There's exceptions to a lot of things, but the exception is not the rule. And when you're looking at these types of cases, you shouldn't be chasing zebras. So in a more advanced situation, the tissue becomes necrotic. Uh, the apex could still be normal in this situation. You could have an increase in the periodontal ligament space. Periapical diagnosis may still be normal, or it could be symptomatic apical periodontitis. You can have an increase in the development of a periapical lesion over time, in which case your periapical diagnosis may be chronic apical periodontitis, or it might even be acute alveolar abscess. And in which case you need to do a root canal if only because of the tooth being necrotic. So then, how do we start testing or developing a differential diagnosis? Well, these are all the tests. We go through all our normal tests that we talk about, and I'll be highlighting some of these in our discussion. 
The first group is the electric pulp test, which has pretty good reliability in telling us if there's vital tissue or if there isn't vital tissue in the tooth. We probe the tooth. Every tooth should be probed before endodontic treatment is initiated. But in terms of distinguishing between endo and periodontal disease, uh, the depths are poor and the pocket in the defect shapes may be fair, and I'll explain this a little bit later. Percussion is poor because both periodontal disease and endodontic disease can contribute to a tooth that's sensitive to percussion. Uh, same thing with palpation, it's often poor. However, if you speak to a periodontist, they'll probably say that if the tooth is very sensitive to percussion, then it's probably endodontic disease. This isn't always the case, and that's why it's necessary to go through a complete diagnosis when you're trying to differentiate between the two. A complete diagnosis just doesn't take that long. The etiology is a fair way to differentiate or to help you differentiate between endo and periodontal disease, and I'll show you an example of that. And when you have the generalized presence of periodontal disease uh, as opposed to a localized, it also may be a good way, but again, it's not absolute. So electric pulp test is good. Always remember that uh, you, the operator, wears a glove. The patient just has to touch the end of this. And as soon as the patient feels the slightest amount of tingling on the tooth, that the, you probably assume that the tooth is vital. Remember, though, you can have a false positive if you have separative fluid or pus in the canal. The separative fluid can transmit the electrical impulses from the EPT tip to the periodontal ligament space, and the patient can get a false positive. However, this tooth is going to feel different than adjacent teeth if you're having that false positive. And that's why it's always important to test more than one tooth when you're trying to assess and make an endodontic diagnosis. Probing depths are poor, shape is fair. You can have extreme probing depths in endo and or periodontal disease, and the shape is fair. What do I mean by this? Well, you know, when you have a shape like this, which is sometimes hard to figure out when you're probing, is uh, this is probably, not exclusively, but probably going to be periodontal disease. When you have a shape similar to this, it's possible that this could be endodontic and not periodontal disease because the lesion would be starting from the apex to the crown. If you have something like this, you know, it could be a vertical root fracture. Again, there's so many variables, and that's why shape is only fair. And if you have a lot of bone loss like this, it's just very difficult to tell. So in this case here, we have a, a sinus tract. You know that whenever you do have a sinus tract that you want to trace it. Uh, the sinus tract by and of itself doesn't really tell you if it's endo or perio. Sometimes if the sinus tract is found more coronal and closer to the gingiva, it might be perio. But again, this and of itself, where this is, is not diagnostic. It's just helpful. So if you do have a sinus tract, trace it and take a radiograph. Percussion and palpation are poor. To repeat myself, you can have sensitivity either with periodontal or endodontic disease. Etiology, again, is only fair. And looking at this tooth as an example, you have some vertical bone loss, you have a lot of tissue loss uh, periapically, but you also see here that this tooth has been entered endodontically. You can see the uh, particles in the canal, uh, and at this point we don't know if this bone loss, uh, vertical bone loss, and all this is due to only endodontic or only periodontal disease, or a combination of both. My preference in something like this would be to complete the endodontic treatment and observe the case. In this tooth, we see etiology. We see caries, recurrent caries under this crown. We see an enlarged PDL space, and just looking at this radiographically. And then we would depend on our diagnostic test to tell us if there's uh, some idea of the vitality of this tooth. You see some bone loss here, but this bone loss can be contributed to, to food becoming lodged in here and just causing a localized inflammation. When we talk about the presence or the absence of periodontal disease, we say it's good. If you have a lesion, a localized lesion in, the, in a patient like this, chances are it could be an endodontic problem only. It's not definitive, but it can be.
However, if you look at this patient and you saw a lesion, your expectations would be that this is probably a patient who has periodontal disease and that bone loss is, is probably generalized and more than uh, just endo. Here's a patient here who had a tooth here. This tooth was, at one point, was in pretty good shape. And then you see that there's a gradual loss of bone. When you're looking at etiology, there really mu isn't much in place here in terms of etiology. This tooth here had endodontic treatment so they could perform a root amputation of the mesial, bu actually both buccal roots here. And you see this is a result of the surgery. Looking at this tooth and you see that there's bone loss, uh, apical lesions, but the etiology here is pretty clear and if you test this tooth, this tooth is going to be vital. And so all the bone loss, all the problems here are really primarily periodontal. So let's, we're going to take a look at symptoms and there's, there would be disagreement here between endodontists and periodontists. Radiographs are fair uh, evaluations, you just thinking about some of the ones we just saw. A test cavity is pretty good when you're trying to decide if a tooth is vital or not. Where the swelling is, the onset of swelling is fair, and the degree of pain the patient may have. So symptoms are poor. This patient was referred to me for endodontic treatment, but in assessing the tooth, you see that you know the, the restoration here really isn't that large. It looks appeared to be well done. You see almost a J-shaped type of lesion. Uh, it, it, it goes periapically. Testing this tooth, this tooth tested normal to uh, EPT, and it tested normal to thermal testing. Very sensitive percussion, very sensitive palpation. This was not an endodontic lesion. This was more than likely a vertical root fracture. Uh, again, we saw this case a little bit earlier. Radiographs are only fair. It appears to have massive periodontal disease. But over time and with a four-year recall and just with routine endodontic care, the tooth ended up healing very well. Here's another situation where, again, it looks like a J-shaped lesion. There is no evidence uh, of a fracture doing the, the normal clinical tests we do. Also with our microscopes, we're able to, in the axis cavity, ex assess the inside of the tooth to see if there's any fractures and then we're, then we're seeing. You can see that there is healing over time. Here's a more interesting case where you have uh, a breakdown and you have the potential of multiple things going on, but in removing the bridge here and taking a good look here, you can see that there's radio lucency in this area you see that there's vertical bone loss here and in removing the tooth and taking a radiograph you see that there was a perforation that somebody may have done in looking for the lingual or the palatal canal in this premolar but went ahead and restored it with a uh, bridge anyway and this tooth of course was not treated it was a combination of endo and periodontal disease but more for lack of treatment instead of over treatment a test cavity is pretty good. This patient was referred to me following an IND done uh, by a periodontist, and the IND was done on the lingual here. However, you know, I did all the normal tests. They were inconclusive because of the crown. I then did a cavity test where I drilled into the tooth, into the dentin. As soon as I drilled into the dentin, the patient felt pain. If you look very closely, and you may not be able to see it on your images, but the gingival height is really at this level. It's very close to normal gingival height, meaning that there's some pocketing here, although there wasn't active endodontic disease. My clinical guess is, and it's only a guess, that the original swelling that this patient had on the lingual was because of food that was caught in the pocket here and it caused swelling. With the IND, the food particles probably came out. So I saw this patient, we did a test cavity, I found nothing to rest nothing, no reason, no indication to a root canal, and we restored the uh, axis cavity with an amalgam. I think if anyone casually looked at this, they would immediately assume that this tooth had periodontal disease because of the location of the swelling. However, you should still go through the diagnostic process. And in going through that, we found that this tooth was actually necrotic. This was an endodontic lesion. 
it doesn't take very much time to do palpal diagnosis with EPT, with thermal testing. It's just a very quick thing that you can do. And I, I think it's, it's incumbent to do that at almost any time. Pain is also uh, part of our diagnostic process. Most practitioners will tell you that if a patient presents in a lot of pain, it's probably endodontic. I don't know that I could really disagree with that, but I can tell you that I have seen patients, and we, and many of us had, where they present in a lot of pain, but it's not an endodontic problem. It could be a periodontal problem. Sometimes it even mimics TMD problems. So good diagnosis is always very helpful in deciding what is really going on. Here's an interesting case that was seen in our clinics here. This patient had two sinus tracts, had one on the lingual, one on the palatal. You can see a very large periapical radiolucency. However, as you're looking at this, there's no etiology. There's no history of trauma. What's going on here? What is the problem? And the problem is actually uh, a lingual groove. A lingual groove is a very, I wouldn't say common, but it's a frequent occurrence that we usually, although not exclusively, but we usually see in maxillary lateral incisors. Here's a case that looked very similar to the one that, uh, to, the, to the radiographs that we were just looking at. And you can see where the lingual groove is present. Uh, when you find something like this, you need to probe it. You need to assess if this tooth is treatable and what the extent of the, the, extent of the periodontal lesion is. And you can see this looks very similar, but the difference between this and the case I showed right before this is that the lesion only goes down about two-thirds of the length of the, of the root, uh, whereas the one we had, the lesion went down the whole lingual surface of, or the pelvis surface of that root. This case here, they did uh, reflected a lingual flap. You can see the groove right here. They used a very fine diamond and gently shaped this, put in some bone material, sutured and over time it healed up so that there wasn't any probing there. There's a lot of things we can do with these cases and every case is different uh, before we consider extraction.